So as Grazia said, I work at the Open University is, uh, at the Knowledge Media Institute, which is uh, in the computer science part of the STEM faculty. So I am uh, a user experience designer and uh, human-computer interaction professor. Do you know what human-computer interaction is, more or less? It's basically the discipline that helps computer science to uh, be more aware when they design new technology of how this could be uh, thought, conceptualized, uh, designed and applied with the humans in mind and not only machines. So if you want, is in computer science a very interdisciplinary field that uh, try to combine the trade-off and also sometimes contradiction between machine and human needs. So. Um, uh, this is my lab, and uh, it's a very diverse, uh, interdisciplinary, and young lab, um, close to uh, about in a city called Milton Keynes, about half an hour from London. Um, and this is my uh, lovely research team, and a lot of the work and projects and uh, tools I will show you today, uh, they are developed thanks to them. Um, so today I would like to talk a lot about, well, I will talk a lot about disagreement and deliberation. And hopefully I will provide you a different way of thinking and looking at uh, what the disagreement is and, uh, and how deliberation in context of very complex, diverse opinion and needs uh, could be structured in a way that is not divisive. So uh, the claim all my research comes from, it's really very applied and comes from an observation that in society we are really struggling and uh, living all around us, uh, social unrest. And, uh, and uh, we see in many events that this brings to conflicts, sometimes very hard conflicts, local conflicts, national, international conflicts that usually happen when a high-level decision, for example, policy-making decision like during COVID or during uh, uh, now the war, are taken by uh, policymakers without really taking into account how citizens feel or how they uh, would anticipate or without anticipating how they would really reacting about specific policy decisions or policy or policy guidelines and uh, increasingly we are seeing that this creates social tension and uh, at the same time uh, with a source of uh, participatory technologies making it to the hands of everyone to have a say uh, citizens increasingly ask new way for their voice to be included into different way to design, decide about the future of your cities, of your countries. Um, so, we clearly are lacking some space in which this dialogue between citizens and policymakers happens. And recently, I don't know if any of you here is familiar with political science uh, theories, you might be familiar with the concept of deliberative democracy. So deliberative democracy <coughs> is a concept that is not new at all, actually. It started in the early 900 when uh, an American philosopher called John Dewey uh, basically said that what modern democracy needs is common knowledge. So citizens really need space and knowledge in which they can come together and discuss and shape their judgments. And uh, there are lots of proponents now, even the European Commission and different countries that are taking this new democratic model as a model to follow because political science theory actually shows that when deliberative democracy happens, when citizens are called upon and uh, to debate and discuss their point of view and, and they have a chance to assess different actions, 
they actually be become much more aware and actually, surprisingly, maybe for some of you, they become much more reflective and are able to make more balanced decisions. So um, in a way, they say this is a good thing. Uh, but deliberative democracy is only possible in, if they, these spaces for citizens to come together and discuss exist. Some of them, they call it, uh, they call this space the public sphere. Um, may some of you, uh, maybe in your planning, yeah, know about uh, Habermas' definition of the public sphere. It's basically a space when any private individual come together with other private individuals in any circumstances of space, in a pub, in a church, in your home, and they start discuss about issues of public concerns to a point that they can shape a public opinion about a complex common issue. And uh, okay, this public sphere is actually claimed to be fundamental to implement this idea of a truly deliberative democracy. But uh, what, are, what do you think, how many of these spaces do you experience in your everyday life? So where are the spaces in which us as groups or citizens come together and start discussing in a very inclusive, open way about our future? about how we would allow our, our city to work, or maybe our university to work. In reality, uh, deliberation, even though it's something, a very ancient way for group to make decisions coming together, it's very poorly supported by any social technical space nowadays. So there are no space for us to come together in this way. And Technologically, there are not technologies that really help us to do it in a very uh, democratic way. So there is a big problem. Um, de facto, this space has been taken by social media because, of course, organizations that needs to consult their constituency, even uh, cities or uh, universities that need to understand what's their point of view of their people around a topic, what do they do? They use probably Facebook or Instagram or whatever, or any other uh, social media space to shape this opinion. Now, the research in computer science in the last 10 years has been quite unequivocal in establishing that social media are very damaging and they are not the right place to discuss in a democratic way these public issues, even though our cities and government seems to not find another place to do so and to engage their, secret, their, their citizens in an open way. So these tools have been uh, shown and demonstrated by very solid scientific study to be very rudimental in the way they structure data and uh, to lack content quality, content variety. You always listen the same idea from the same people. Um, they lack feature for sense making and for people to really advance their understanding on any topic they are looking for. So how do you navigate an Instagram feed or a Twitter feed if you want to learn about something? So uh, situational awareness and support to informing your decision is very poor. Of course, these tools have also a lot of negative socio-technical effects that have been widely demonstrated. So they create uh, negative phenomena such as echo chambers and the production of silos, information, and then homophily, homophily uh, lack of diversity, polarization, division, conflicts, and even to the point uh, to harm. So they, are be, they have become very unsafe space for discussing specific public issues. So why do we keep using them? Well, uh, there are some problems of this 
systems that might be related to how users or people use them. Yeah, we all know that there are, you know, like uh, trolls or people that want to harm online. But some of these problems are actually very technical. So they are design problems. One of the first problems is that these tools, they only present uh, positions and content in a very time-centered way, like a flat listing of posts with no coherence, no structure, no labeling. And uh, basically, it's very hard to understand any logic of what has been said, what are the questions raised, what are the problems arising. For what matters, you don't even know how many people are taking place in that debate. It could be 10 people shouting a lot or 300. You don't even know you have a way to, to understand who is saying uh, what. So this is content is very scattered and has a very low signal to noise radio. So lots of noise, no content and knowledge. They also very poorly support any type of debate because there is no way to understand where ideas contrast. You know, if you say something, how can you identify if someone else in the discussion says something that is actually opposite to what you said? Um, and there is no way to understand where or what people disagree and on what. So there is really no way to analyze and make sense of what's going on in this conversation. And also, and very problematically, they reward popularity rather than critical thinking. So you might have noticed that all these platforms, they only have appreciative feedback gathering. Thumbs up a star, a heart, like if we were all a happy family that we all uh, agree on everything and we all have the same values and objectives and colors and everything. So of course, it has been actually mathematically proved that, that this produced polarization. This design choice produced one of the most harmful damage of social media. Now, I'm not gonna bother you of the reason why some of this company initially had a, a thumb up and a minus and a discussion space and they have soon been deleted. And the reason are all market related, but you, we can discuss this here at another point. But the point is that Democracy needs diversity. In democracy, disagreement is normal. It's actually part of our right to be different. With equal right to be different. So it needs system and spaces for debate in which, first of all, disagreement is not stigmatized. Where we are not obliged to be all the same or do the same choice or like the same things. And not liking something is not a reason to be put aside or be given a label or be siloed in certain way of thinking or acting. So then another bad negative point. There is no way to support any idea refinement. This system has no way to help people to co-create. And how do we co-create solution to complex problem? Are we expecting a genius to come with the answer and then we all vote for him? So even the most advanced and very nice petition system, they have only voting mechanism for, for in which solo ideation is prized and rewarded. You can only vote for it. If, no matter how many things you can do to improve this idea, you must like it as it is. <laughs> so you may understand as uh, when you tackle complex problem in a democracy where there are no right or wrong solution for everyone, there is no way that you will find the one clear solution that fit everyone. And the solution needs to be negotiated, improved, need to be deliberated together. So this is, Pretty big problem for applying a tool like this for deliberative democracy. So all these tools have this huge limitation. 
So about 15 years ago, uh, lots of people started looking at a new class of uh, tools that they are called deliberation technologies that start with a very simple idea. So they build on the theory from argumentation and political science and uh, computer supported argument visualization. But the main concept is that if we only add a little level of structure in which we make the line of agreement and disagreement between ideas and people visible so that they, they can become an object of discussion and reflection, then the quality of the deliberation improves. So the way in which these tools do that is by building a very simple data model in which instead of having posts, unclassified posts, you have, you can say, I'm raising a question, this is an answer to this question, this is a pro for this solution, this is a con for this solution, that's it. Question, answer, pro and con, very simple. And uh, this simple structure has proved to be very easily usable and really not impact a lot the, use, the difficulty for non-expert users to, to adopt this technology. So it has become quite spread. So in a way, what these technology are trying to do, as I said before, is to break this stigma around disagreement being a bad thing, but actually making it visible so that people, in a way, they, uh, they can understand and then almost naturally embed and accept that there is not only one way to look at a position. So the right way of thinking about complex problems is not finding the right solution, but perhaps is thinking in a very ambivalent way of the potential answer or the potential pro and con of this solution. So this links to uh, research into ambivalent thinking. This is research in psychology and sociology that in a way try to explain why lots of people have this stigma with the disagreement. Why disagreement? Everybody thinks it's bad. Why is that? Well, psychologists tell us that there is a very clear reason why this happened. And the reason is that when you start being presented with two different ways to look at something, you start feeling discomfort because we like clarity and, and we like, we are like babies. We like to have clear answer, right? So, Ambivalent positioning is a little bit unsettling and people tend to avoid it in some situation can bring some sorts of anxiety and then some study have said that that can not really bring to cognitive flexibility. At the same time though, there has been an increasing number of research that have observed how this phenomenon affects not individually in, in isolation, but in social context, that shows that the experience of ambivalence in actually makes exactly the opposite. So increases our capability because we see it to basically accept that things could be seen in different way and in a way it makes us more open to accept other people's positions. And it starts breaking our silos rather than creating them, which, as we said, it seems quite counterintuitive. In the, sense, in, in the context of uh, making sense of things, there are even research that says that a more emotional ambivalence, so not only cognitive ambivalence, but when we really think like we are emotionally divided, is actually a good thing for us because it makes us much more quick to react to unexpected information, unexpected events, and makes us much more flexible to react. So in a way, 
think about ambivalent thinking and the objective of these technologies to provide you an instrument to share and to look when you discuss something, not just at the solution, but also the pro and con of those in a very open way as a way that actually can help you elaborate difference in a large group and bringing you closer to see other people's point of view that might not actually be your native point of view. And visual thinking and cognitive dissonance are is in a way a nice tool because cognitive dissonance uh, is another, if you want, psychological reaction that we feel every time we are presented with uh, some information or experience that doesn't match our beliefs or our previous knowledge. So when we, in a way, when we get to know something that is very difficult, very different from something we were really con convinced about, we tend to push it away initially. Study shows though that if this is do not done in uh, an exaggerated and aggressive way, it might have the opposite effect. So it sparks your curiosity. So because your mind is going to be trying to make sense, we want to live in coherent work. So your mind is going to start to find way and information all around that so that your vision of the world can be reconciled in their complexity. So in a way, cognitive disson dissonance, it is a leverage for engagement in critical dialogue in a deliberative democracy context. So the liberation technology have this aim. So strike the trade-off of design of new deliberation technology that can use the right healthy level of cognitive dissonance and ambivalent thinking showing you different point of view of something but without dividing positions, making you curious because I propose you knowledge that is different from the knowledge you have in a way that help you to be closer, more creative in the way that you tackle complexity. So you might have know, um, you might know some of these technology, but I thought I would show some of them for you. So one of them is Kialo. Uh, all of them they have hyperlink if you want to have a look at them. So Kialo is an argumentation-based discussion system, and it looks like this. So it has I don't know if you can see it, but it has on the top. He has a, poli a position, you can see a little tree here, and then you see red and green like child coming from out of it, and you can see them also in a column, and they provide easy way for people to come together and discuss different positions representing it in this two column way. And uh, it is used by hundreds of thousands of educators, students, organizations that needs to come together and solve complex issues. Yeah? So uh, you might want to have a look at it. Another great tool is Consider It. So Consider It is, uh, is uh, one of the, actually the oldest tool that was used for uh, planning and public engagement, especially in the US in Seattle, and, uh, and, and, and I love this tool because it has a beautiful visualization, which is this one that you can see here. So why do I like this visualization? So the, the point is that this tool has a, a very nice way to show people that they might be far from each other on one position and very close on others. Because you might imagine, you, you might be this one, right? And you might have your friend here thinking like, ooh, we are very far, all right? We are very far from each other. And then you might go here and see that actually you and your friend, out of 10 of these, you are here on four. So you 
are not that far away because it's true that on this position you actually not really agree in the same way but there are you agree in the reason <laughs> so this gives you the chance to dig into what does it mean ah oh, I'm visualized very far and polarized. Is that really true? Actually, 90, I can tell you because I've analyzed a lot of data, it's never the case. Because uh, you are always sharing a lot of reason and pro and con with people that are very far away on that chart there. So from the way they collect data to the way they visualize data, they show you that, that you can disagree, you can have different pro and con, you can assess the conversation from diverse point of view, and this does not mean you are being classified as people in silos group of thinking. So in a way, you experience it. So it's, it's almost like it doesn't happen because you don't see it happening. So it, it's a lovely tool. Polis is another tool. I can see that uh, the, the formatting of Google Doc is a bit interesting. Anyway, Polis is a great tool too, and it has been used all over the world, really, by many governments and organizations to, co to involve large, this time very large amount of citizens into consultation about specific uh, urban uh, decisions. And, uh, but also not only urban, I think they have worked a lot with the general policies too. Uh, and again, another reason why I like this tool is because it has a, a very nice visualizations in which um, it shows you how through the expression of many different positions, not only one, you might be coming close or far from someone else. So, you basically have an AI algorithm that from your answer to many of these statements position you in, in an n-dimensional space uh, and therefore calculate with a much more uh, richness how you are close and far from a person and not just from the fact that you have put a thumb up or down on one position which is usually how we read each other social relationship on social media. Bit worrying. So, uh, so all these technologies have a lot of advantages and they have been demonstrated scientifically. So they help communities to be much more systematic and complete in their deliberation about complex problems. They support evidence-based dialogue. So that problem of the quality, of the data quality and the uh, noise level, it's uh, by default. So it's almost like when people are called upon doing different, th difficult things in a positive way, they actually start sharing good content <laughs> and good knowledge. So it can, the, the things go in a way together. And it supports the development of shared understanding on also in a very dividing context, like context of politics, high divided politics, war debates, very, very, very hard context. Instead of dividing people, it brings them closer. And of course, improve the quality of the argumentation under many metrics, and I'm not gonna bother you, like metrics of uh, uh, inclusion, diversity of ideas, anyway, it's, but <laughs> it also have a limitation. And one of the main limitation is really the lack of, uh, of uh, intuitive and easy to use interface that are so similar to what people are used to work and they look so pretty enough and modern enough <coughs> and effective enough so that they can really be embedded in people practice. They also um, require some of them a level of data formalization that some people and also the visual, visual literacy that might not be for everyone. And, um, and then they lack some support for sense making and idea assessment. So basically, very few of these technology help the, the 
deliberation move forward toward collective decision making. So if you are open a discussion and you came out 300 people, 1,000 ideas, how do you go then to reduce the solution space and then eventually make a collective decision or prioritization on what is feasible, on what to do? So the decision making cycle also requires closing down. And then there are very few tools that helps communities and groups to move toward the collective decision making spectrum. So I have dedicated my career to trying to develop new tools for, uh, uh, for solving some of this <laughs> tool. And you will be happy to know that I am only scratching the surface. <laughs> Uh, because the, the problems are really serious and really wide. But um, uh, I have developed a series of technologies. You can, ask, uh, if you are curious, you can either contact me or you can access my website. Uh, there are, I think, eight or nine of them, but I'm going to just show three because you need to survive today. Uh, and I choose these three because I wanted to give you a, a sort of an idea that deliberation in the public spheres is huge and can happen at many levels, at many scales, and at many different, in many different contexts. So I have picked up three tools that are very different so that it can give you an idea of the spectrum of technologies we are talking about and problems we are talking about. So the first one is called the light map. You can access this at lightmap.net. And the light map is basically, I thought I had a link, but I don't. Okay, that lightmap.net. Uh, it's basically a tool for civic leaders. And uh, the, what is really uh, cool of this tool is that it has the specific objective to uh, try to break conversational silos. So imagine you have analyzing problems of mobility in the city of Milan. How many websites and how many different social media groups you might find in which these problems are discussed? And if you want to make a picture of these debates across all this conversation and group. How do you do it? So Lightmap has um, a bookmarklet that uh, basically is that thing that you look there and it appears on the side of your browsers. And you can think about it like if it's your, if it's the web is a book and uh, this is your highlighter. So you can go around and highlight any bits of text that is relevant to mobility in Milan. Maybe you found it a key problem that you want to bring to your community for discuss. So you can highlight these bits of problem and then you click on the question icon up there. You can annotate and say like, I think this is a very relevant problem because of this, this and that. And then you save it. And once you save it, this, your annotation with the hyperlink to the page, it comes to a 2D canvas space, which is this one, in which you can take your notes and start linking them. So if you have now raised a question, now you can, for example, add an answer that you found on another web. And you can link it and say, like, this is an answer to this question. Then you go, I can find some evidence against your answer on another website. And I can go there and highlight it and link a con to your positions. So you can see the same argument map that you saw before. Here you can draw it. But this time, while preserving provenance from different scattered qualitative data that is around the different discussion sites. Uh, Lightmap has also a CI dashboard. So basically, as I said, one of the big issues of this tool is that they don't have support for sense making. So how do I know anything about how many people participated to this discussion? Is there a social network 
forming, who is talking to who, can I see the social network, can I see So, Lima has all this, this visualization here that I'm not going to show you, but uh, um, it basically gives you a lot of visual analytics that you can automatically click upon to reflect on your group discussion. It's going to tell you, for example, some of them are temporal contribution. You can see when the group was more or less active. You can see, for example, if people are disagreeing a lot on something or, and, and go and drill then and see who is disagreeing with what. You can see the social network. So imagine now you are a civic leader and a community manager. You have now an easy way to analyze the healthiness of your community and therefore have an instrument to do something to improve it. So this is the way Line Map and all the other tools use visualization, has the reflective trigger trigger way to help like if we were all community analysts and we were all reflecting on our own uh, collective uh, result so this is a little bit of statistic but anyway light map is used by lots of people and is losing uh, urban planning local area coordination a lot in uh, in uh, teaching uh, so you are very welcome to have a look at it Another one is democratic reflection. So now we move from civic debate to political elections debate. So democratic reflection is uh, a tool that aims to change the way in which we engage with the political discussion on television. So this is a completely different tool. It's a second health device that uh, technology that could be explored either from your phone or your tablets, while, for example, you are watching a political debate on television, or maybe in a live event if you are at a politician talk. So the, the idea was that uh, usually political debates are not really debates, are they? Because they are a one-way communication from the politician to an empty screen. And really, there is no much way for the community to engage in this way in any way. He has widely proved that, that Twitter becomes harmful in this in, in, and not useful at all at mapping how the citizens are reacting to the, to the political conversations. So how could we do it? How could we better understand the audience, what the citizens are thinking, their views in a very detailed way? But also, how can we know how the, the citizens have assessed or have learned anything from this democratic, actually, one of the most important democratic experience in our democratic countries, which is the way in which we have gone about. <laughs> so we put together this uh, new tool, and uh, it works like this. So you have a mobile app in which a second string interaction in which you can choose from a series of reflective statements. So imagine them like colored flashcards, like the ones there. These are some examples of some of them we are tested with. Uh, that have very easy, uh, but they have a very specific way to, in a way, elicit your reaction. Because each of them is aimed to make you think to what extent the politician is engaging you in a democratic uh, uh, conversation. So, for example, is it really talking to you? Do you feel empowered? Is it re all things that? Uh, we don't actually think about while we are watching political debate, which in general is perceived as a win-lose context. Who won the debate today, Corbyn or Boris Johnson? So these cards are very nuanced meaning, and then they are voluntary, non-intrusive. You might not click on any of them and just watch the debate happily. But if you do click on them, lots of nice things happen. So this is one set of cards that we have uh, tested in the 2019 debate, for example, in the, in the debate between Corbyn and Johnson. And you can see the five democratic dimension assessed with two positive and negative statements. So you could 
you could click on them if while they are talking you felt for example that he's talking to us honestly and respectfully or if you think that he's being elusive or manipulative and so on in other contexts we have been much more detailed we have asked up to 25 cards so people the first question that everybody asks is like, nah, user will never be able to even make sense and click on 25 cards, each of them very charged. Like a lot of these cards analyze, for example, making sense of what they say from information utility to really information trust. Or because you move from this is useful information. Oh, I'm not actually thinking. I'm not sure this is true. So we had cards that could measure trust and many things. And you would be impressed to know that we have tried this with 25 cards and not digital literature people, also quite old people, and they will use them all. This is a tribute of the human intelligence because I also thought they would not, but they did, all across the two hours. So when you finish clicking, then uh, what do you get? You get a series of personalized analytics. And this is another huge difference for the, the, the usual way of engaging with these technologies. This is a way for you to learn something about yourself not about others, not about the political debate, but about you. So you would see here, for example, the different politician and how much you have clicked positive or negative toward them. You could see that uh, how much you felt respected or engaged or so on. These are the five democratic entitlements. And then you get an automatically generated report that it's not showing you your peak, so it's not going to tell you, oh, you click 90% uh, of the ta time, you clicked on respect. No, it's going to do the opposite. It's going to tell you the gaps. So it's going to perhaps attract your attention saying like, you know the 90% of the time you were in favor of this claim, but there were three times in which you felt really you could not trust what this politician was saying and it gives you the possibility to go back and explore it so these reports are designed to stretch your thinking to make you understand that there is not only one way that your assumption about about yourself the way you vote what you should do might be wrong and uh, we have tested it very widely in the 2015, 17, and 19 debates, and the results are actually quite, oh, I don't have it here. I think I got the wrong <laughs> presentation, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, I'm gonna tell you the story. So in uh, um, results from the interviews and the focus group show that 90% of the time people never recognize their self on their own analytics. <laughs> what do you think that means? There are so many unconscious bias or assumption even on ourselves that we get wrong. So we had people, many people, saying that this experience would most definitely affect I would do and change in each assumption they had before they watched. People that said, I always thought I liked this candidate, but then I saw my analytics and I said that, I saw that I was so positive toward this other candidate, so I'm gonna go and check his manifesto. So in a way, this was a widely successful demonstration that even in a very dividing context as politics, in which people assume that we are entrenched in our beliefs, in our opinion, that older people cannot change their mind, it's not true. The way in which we are called into thinking about our democratic engagement in election, in politics, are flawed. 
We are doing it, and the reason why we're losing interest in engaging in these processes that are crucial for our future is because we are engaged in a very poor way. It's not even interesting. 100% of the people that tested, and we tested it with thousands of people, all of them said that if there was one tool like this to watch the political debates in the future election, they would use it. And in the reason why they used it, it wasn't because they wanted to know what the other people thought. No, because they wanted to learn about themselves. And they were quite surprised. And surprise meant curiosity. And curiosity means engagement from one of the most crucial democratic activity for our society. The third tool is because. So because it's now a completely different tool, you can access it to because.app. So now because it's the most similar tool to a common online discussion technology. So really, it, it looks like this. So if you look it at the center, it really looks a little bit like WhatsApp. But it's an argumentative structure, what's up? So you have a position, and then you have your pro, but you have two columns, and you can add pro and con to different positions. Very simple. We have tried it with many people, no usability issues. Quite easy. We're not asking people to annotate, link, or do very complex things. The interface design on your own tell you very easily where you can write. And so it's quite easy for you to engage on this. But this technology, which by the way we have tested and has provided, we have compared it with uh, WhatsApp with, I think, five, 500, people, no, 50 group for a total of 500 people. So we are quite certain that there was uh, not only lower engagement with this technology compared to a normal uh, WhatsApp interface, but there was a much higher engagement as assessed with 12 dimension of engagement. So, you know, next time someone tells me that they don't want to use an argumentation tool because it's too hard to use. Or we're going to use peop lose, lose people because the, it's not very engaging. I'm going to probably kill them. Uh, but one of the key things that these things makes very different from common social media is these buttons. So you can see here that you can still reply to things. You can still, there is a little heart there, but it doesn't do what you think you're doing. So if you click that heart, you are just thanking the author. So there is no appreciative, cumulative uh, feedback you can give, but you can show great gratitude. So it takes the good of appreciation, remove the bad of popularity. So there is no cumulative number in anywhere in this interface. The other big design choice is that the button we have there, the give your opinion and the reflect. Oh, go on. If one comment gets more likes, yeah. there is no likes in here. Do you see any likes? There is no likes. No. So the heart is a. Th so if you like something that I said, you can click my heart. You can click the heart. The heart is going to become red on your screen, so you know you thanked me already, right? Yeah. On my screen, I see the heart with all the number on the side of all the people that thank me, but if you go there, you see nothing. Is it something between me and you? So there is no way to filter this by likes. That is a very good question, and uh, we don't at the moment, and this is a choice. In a sense, we have decided that, and this is 
to be discussed if it works or not because we haven't tested it. Um, we have made a design choice uh, that uh, um, changing the, uh, removing the timeline order would be, ups it's, uh, it, it would be unsettling for uh, um, non-expert people that are used to social media to relate to the conversation. So there are research that says that one of the reasons why social media, people rely on social media is because of that linearity, which is very similar to how conversation happen in real life. So for example, in that other tool you saw, Chialo, there is no timeline. So you say that, you, do you remember the three? You know, the pro and con that you saw that? There is no conversation exchange line. This is a conversation exchange line. So you could, if you start from the top and the bottom is, you, you see the timing? So if I come there in three months, I can restart the conversation and follow, understanding what was said before or after. So we don't filter and show before, you know, in the queue or whatever, in the list, anything. Like we leave it in this view to the temporal dimension because this is the view for data entry. And uh, well, there are studies that says that for entry contribution, linearity is very important, but not when it gets to sense making. So there is a visualization dashboard here here, where we do an awful lot of different analytics. And you actually gave me a good idea. One of these visualization could be about the, yeah, the, the, the thankness, you know, like the, the altruity or whatever. I don't know how should we call it, but I like the idea to have one visualization for everyone to look at, for example, what are you know the more uh, uh, recognized uh, thankful messages right but uh, at the moment we haven't done it and i am i am very intrigued to understand how we can do that without sparking popularity dynamics so it's a very good thing but it's a very good idea but i'm yeah a design challenge yeah, but I don't know. You know, like it's a very good point. Credibility, it's an important thing, but is credibility built only on social feedback? For example, one thing that we can, I don't know if you can see here, but there is an option, not in this image, I think I, this is a different screenshot. There is an option for you, there is a fetch button that doesn't appear here, probably is an older version. So if you are on a post, you can uh, click on fetch and then interrogate the scientific literature and get recommended evidence, scientific evidence for your claims. So you might have a good practice so that you look for good evidence and you attach them to your claims so that you gain credibility on that on the quality of what you say and the evidence you give me for making you credible rather for than for how much how many people necessarily like your idea right mm -hmm. don't forget the entire objective of this is to break that reasoning to have a different way in which in a deliberative democracy really you try to focus not only on the social dynamics, but actually on the real content of the ideas that have been posed and the concrete advantages and disadvantages for an idea that ideally should be assessed in the less biased way. In fact, that visualization provides analysts the help in kind of uh, move themselves into that and the other thing because now we are uh, jumping but it's okay uh, on the side here so there are two ways that we have tried to help uh, this point of the complexity so what happens when the conversation becomes huge how do i navigate because i cannot go linearly because there are 500 right so 
there are these two things here. So this one is for newcomers. So it's a sort of creative synopsis that is automatically built. And this one is the AI bid that, uh, that Grazia was talking about. So this is an automatically generated summary, dynamic summary of the entire 700 page discussion. It's a, so the how G, well how we how usually uh, this sort of uh, abstractive summarizer work is that they you create prompts which are basically questions maybe like kind of uh, um, tell and these prompts are designed linguistically. So you say, for example, uh, give me uh, the first most opposed idea. Now present the less discussed one and the most contradictory one, three prompts, like of this kind, right? Of course, we have an architecture of prompts of different kind, but you can have plenty. Like you can, you can ask, prompt the question in, in any way you want, yeah? So now I don't remember exactly what Lucas, uh, which is uh, the person, the, the designer, uh, asked, but I think he gave, it was quite simple. So it was like, uh, gave, uh, a threshold, like a smaller, like give me a 20 line summary, which is as complete as you can. And I don't remember what prompt he had. And we got this, he trained different, well, he tried with different prompt. And this one was the one that worked better. And there is a way I think, well, I mean, Lucas would, should have, should come to make a presentation of that because really he is the researcher on this. But he also noticed that if you query it asking precise about spe precise argument with a specific language, is get, it gets more accurate. So anyway, it's all about kind of the design of the prompting. But as a matter of fact, that's why it's a creative synopsis. You know, like this is kind of the AI summary of it. But when a conversation is really large, it gives you the gist if you want, so that if you are a newcomer and you want to understand what this is about, it's actually pretty impressive. So if you want to go to Because and, tr and have a look at it, it's just scarily good. But we don't know how uh, correct it is. Yeah. So this is one. So this is for newcomers. So to give you the sense, the overview, like even to know if you can be interested in this or not. Then here are, but I mean, I think I have to, I can't show you. Well. But anyway, there are the sense-making nuggets. I don't have a proper, oh yeah, no. The sense-making nuggets, you can see them here, most contrasted and uh, most argued. And then I think we have the neglected idea and the long tail one. So we have basically identified a little bit like I did with the personalized uh, summaries. So we try to provide entry point so that they can capture your attention. So for example, the contradictory finding, and then we use argument mining technologies to go and look into the discussion and find out this contradictory points or issues. And this is a way, if you want, for you to have a direction on where you think your expertise or your knowledge or your interest might be directed into the conversation. The other thing we have done for giving you a view is this uh, visual index. So on the right, you can see like the, the tree but this time this is an index. So if you scroll it up and down, for example, you can see that there is one position that is with nothing, or you can see 
one position with a lots of con and one pro, you might want to go there. You know, like it gives you, if you want again, another entry point way to make you reflect this time more on the structure and balance of the, um, of the conversation, if you want to get it from there. And then the last thing is the visualization. So has the other tool, it has a lot of visualization. This one, it's a particularly nice one. You might recognize it's quite similar to the one who considered it. <laughs> because I really like that one. <laughs> so in this one, this is a visualization to see in one click if your community is polarized. How do you know in one click if you are in a polarized community? You can see it from that view. So in, uh, if you go here and you find that these groups of people are here, it means this is a very polarized community. And you can go in and, and try to understand through the link, selecting on them, this shows you what they said. And you can see also the different idea and how they connect. So you can start making sense of the reason why the polarization might be happening. And as a community manager with the interest of the health of your organization, then you might do something about it. So this is like, uh, and we have another series of visualizations that have all these objectives. So giving people instrument to think about what's going on and contribute in an open-minded way. This, this, the summary, yes, but this, this visualization of the people is done on the base of what people said. Okay. There is no AI there. This is exactly what each one said because I ask you to agree and disagree on things, I'm just plotting how much you have agreed or disagreed with each other. It's you, you did it. Like there is no interpretation on this. But if you see people in these two groups, you know it's polarized and you can see who people might want to, but uh, in critical democratic theory, that might not be a good thing to do because in a way, what you are trying is to uh, solve a problem, not judge a collective of people. So it's, don't know, for, for, for now, I didn't give them the weapon to do that. So not gonna happen to my side. <laughs> so this is the kind of the point. The point is that designers like you guys have a lot of power. You guys have the power to create what, in a way, you think is the right uh, social interaction that uh, you think your platform should support. And one of the big problem is not recognizing that every single pa platform is actually doing that. So every single platform has a very precise social dynamics of power and interaction. And the designer might or might not be that aware of what this power is, even when they are designing it, but they are doing it. And that's why a key point is being aware of this and doing it transparently. Finished. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, uh, Anna, so much, and thanks, I say thanks to everybody here to uh, so for this invitation um, so it's a little bit late and I think it was no 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 I think it was really um, inspiring somehow uh, even if quite difficult uh, from my perspective uh, but uh, what I will add here maybe is a reflection on how um, some urban design process, since I'm, uh, I can speak from this point of view, since I'm like a, 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 an urban designer involved in uh, citizen engagement 
or better, I would say I'm interested in uh, understanding how the design process can be enriched and, um, and somehow um, exploded to, to, to enhance different other practices to engage more people and maybe to become something that was un unseen in the beginning. So I had the impression that this research that I'm doing uh, could really benefit from the, uh, this um, uh, cognitive dissonance, from this, <laughs> this thing about the ambivalence or the ambivalent uh, thinking um, could be really a, um, like a, an approach, the, the general approach that you are providing through your tools is is really something that is shared in, in, in a reflection about on how design can be more open. Uh, it could be really the access to this uh, approach, in my view. Um, and then I had a lot of ideas on how uh, those tools that you suggest could be used in, in different moments and phases of a design process, of a collective, somehow collective, but I would prefer to say open design process. Um, in, in, in the way that uh, these tools um, could help us in reorganizing the design phases or the structure of the, cr the creative part of our work as far as we um, are working in cities, in urban transformations, um, and recreate really a process that fragments a, a little bit more the design to, to make it validate it uh, in different ways through different stages using different tools and perspectives that could really um, de de rebuild this, uh, um, maybe the phasing that we have in mind. This concern, the possibility of having a lot of time. So to really um, um, disgregate, I don't know how to say, to, to think that this fact of uh, resources, so resources for a, for a while, they have been, we have been with, um, with a few resources in the transformation of cities. Now we are facing a very quick moment of fundings and so or new occasions. So maybe um, this is also to be considered on which tool can help every specific phase when we are in the condition of waiting if we consider urban transformations, for instance, we know that the city is full of um, underused and uh, uh, areas that are waiting for solutions. So how to deal with, uh, um, with this? Maybe we could reach uh, questions and answers that are maybe not uh, finalized, that are not definitive, but could be helpful to help uh, decision making, fragmenting it in steps. So this is my thought. I don't know if it was clear, but I had it in mind uh, just uh, now. It gets on my uh, reflection. Ah, that's why. <laughs> No, they, they, because she looked at me like if I had to answer a question, but I didn't see the question, so I was like, okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, so I, I am, uh, my background, I mean, I'm a civil engineer. I'm not an urban planner. So how many civil engineer here? Any civil engineer? No? How many urban planners? Hey, nice. How many social scientists? <laughs> one, only one. <laughs> and the rest? What? Architects. Architects. <gasps> I love it. So, now, architects are a problem for me. Sorry. <laughs> Your personality is on the way. You know? Okay, so. 
for for the at least for deliberative democracy and computing especially user centered computing i think there is only one rule which is the user is always right even when you want to kill him or her because you think you have done the best thing and he just thinks that is horrible and he cannot understand it and he's always right you think you are amazing but actually he is right or she is right because if she cannot understand it if she doesn't like it or he doesn't like it there's something wrong <laughs> with my design so in a way your ego is very proved by user-centered design, very proved. And I want to know how many architects can do that. Take it and take it. Another humiliation and another humiliation and another humiliation. So in a way, it's kind of hard because uh, honestly, I think that one of the hardest parts of designing uh, technology-mediated urban engagement is that the urban space is not only ours yeah so it all comes from the fact that these are really a common space like uh, like uh, like uh, grazia said and designing the common is actually there is a huge community of uh, in computing and in design that are striving to find design guidelines for designing the common you know even defining what the common is and it's so hard you know like it's so hard to tap because it's something that is like it's individually mine but everyone can say it's individually mine <laughs> and it's also ours so it's so difficult how do you design anything uh, that is for this common space and i think this is like the the mother of all the problems uh, for urban architects and urban designers and in terms of phasing if you think in terms of phasing that let you enter and engage and the matter is not the, en the engagement now is on how these tools can provide the support to define uh, w w what is on stage, what, what is the argument, what is the, um, so to sup really help the design of the thing, in my view, but maybe fragmenting it in, uh, in different moments. And I don't know, I, you know, like, I, I, I don't know if this, tools are necessarily all supporting faces. I don't even know if it makes sense for them to be used in a sequence or in, because they're all uh, their own thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's very hard to think about, you know, uh, an holistic, like uh, uh, process in which you can use all of them, but maybe I haven't understood maybe what you meant. Maybe some of them, I don't know. But, uh, but one thing I wanted to, uh, well, no, the, the, the thought is gone, it's okay. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, I'm It's true, can you introduce yourself? No, very quick. Anna Moro, and uh, I am an uh, okay, urban designer, and I, uh, I do research and also design, okay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Irene Bianchi, I'm working here in this department as a postdoc, and thank you for the invitation, I'm very happy to discuss with you. And um, I had a couple of points, one more connected with the, the issues of the, the capacity of these uh, tools to, to trigger somehow also actual transformations in the context or in the communities of reference. If I have time, maybe I can go to this later. But um, my main um, discussion point was, my main question was about how this, uh, this deliberative uh, tool 
relate to conflict. Uh, you were introducing the role of uh, disagreement and constructive disagreement, uh, highlighting the potential of these tools or also uh, in the definition of shared sp spaces of interaction, uh, for example, facilitating the identification of boundary objects th that could somehow bring on the same discussion table people with very different opinions and point of view. Um, you were highlighting the potential of, uh, trans uh, of uh, cognitive dissonance, of ambivalent thinkings, and the need to go out of the silos and enlarge the spectrum, broadening the spectrum of, of the discussion. Uh, and when highlighting the um, identifying also the, posi the possible negative uh, impacts of this process, uh, you were referring to echo chamber, to homophily, but also to identifying conflicts as a possibly as a negative byproduct of a, of a process that was not designed so well. Mm -hmm. So uh, as, uh, as the consequence of a failure in the design of the platform somehow. So my urban planner <laughs> question to you is, uh, how do you think these deliberation technologies and particularly the platform you presented are considering issues of contestation that are embedded in uh, discourses in the public sphere, uh, happening in the public sphere, referring to wicked problems, to urban transformation, to complex, let's say, and, and multi-level um, issues. Uh, and uh, in particular, how you are uh, articulating this in the, in the theoretical reflection and is at the base of your work. You were referring to critical uh, democratic theory uh, that is also dealing with this issue, how you were, you were considering the, these. Uh, how do you think these assumptions are affecting the design of the, of the tools you, 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 you were presenting to us? For example, in the paper, on Lightmap you, you, you propose us, you were saying that you were avoiding direct replies. That is a way somehow to depotentiate <laughs> or to, 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 to avoid potential conflicts in the discussion, right? Well, that, yeah. And yeah, it is. There was because there is a white, actually a dub 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 paper which, uh, which has been tested with really lots of people no, no. demonstrate exactly that. No, no, I, I'm sure it does, but the point is, so it, the conflict does not disappear, no, no if it disappears from the platform. No. So also, how do you think actors that bring different experiences or points of view that are not in line with the general framing of the problem you propose on the platform, how do you think they would feel, if they will, would be willing to participate in the discussion at all? And to what extent do you think they would be feel comfortable mm -hmm. in this interaction space? It's a very, it's a, it's a great, well, there were many questions and they are all great in a sense. Uh, I, will, I don't know where I start from the last one. So the last one was about how do you think, do you think that, for example, people with a completely different theoretical frame, like for example, you know, like would they ever use a tool like that? It's a very good question. I don't know. Uh, I haven't tried. Uh, my experience is that there is almost a natural selection in a way, so your answer is no, they would not. Because uh, um, in previous tool, we have noticed that in order to be, to engage with something, you need to have a minimal affinity to it. It could be a conceptual affinity, a visual affinity, an emotional affinity. So these people might not find that affinity with this platform. So they might not, they might not. The answer is probably they might not. And I, and I see this, of course, as a problem. Um, for what in, instead concerns the problem of conflicts, I think actually that these tools are brilliant at anticipating and even um, uh, avoiding conflicts. Because they, basically there is a lot of research in conflict, whatever, that says that a very high percentage of conflicts comes from 
misunderstanding or misinterpretation between each other opinion. And one of the things that this tool does is making uh, the structure of different point of view visible for reflection. So if there are kind of, by making explicit in fine grain so many dynamics of the debate, the tool already clarify a lot that usually is unsaid, untold, and assumed. And just for that, it is actually a very potentially uh, powerful tool to avoid, miti not mitigate, but avoid concept to come. The second thing why you could avoid it is because always through the analytics, you give the chance to community manager to act to identify where, for example, polarized groups might be emerging and doing something for mitigating or having them coming together in the right way before the conflict explodes. So I would say if the conflict is there, right, it's not going to solve it, right? But it has a huge potential into avoiding conflicts to happen because it allows a healthier way to discussing our differences. So, and makes this difference visible for people to reflect on them. So I think not as a conflict resolution at all, it cannot be a conflict resolution tool, but these are conflict, it can, these te deliberation technology can be very powerful conflict, uh, moderation, mediation uh, technologies. But yeah, of course, not conflict resolution. For, for opinion, from conflicts of opinion of people not understanding or No, not. look, we have applied one of that tool in Rwanda with people that have been in the genocide. They were not conflict of opinion. They were people that have been killing each other. So no, not comp conflict, conflicts of identities. So it's a much deeper conflict than that. And, uh, but even conflicts of identities might be changed or affected or improved if you prese present people with diversity of opinion, interpretation, uh, positions, impact, values, I truly believe that what we think is the problem is actually the solution. Our uh, disagreement and diversity is actually the best way for us to come together. I know, it looks crazy. I think we can stop officially the meeting, but if you want, we can stay here to to keep the discussion on, okay? So thank you, Annalisa, very much for being with us.